Hello, everyone. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Davis. Um, I started with Edition Dram when it opened about four and a half years ago. I'm the general manager here. Um, it's been a great four years. Kensington has been really supportive of us. Um, and uh, we have a great relationship with Kensington Park Senior Living Facility. So I'd like to say thank you to them and thank you to everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, with me is Matt. He's our head bartender here. Um, if uh, you come in, you'll be the guy behind the bar. Uh, so our purpose of talking about whiskey with you today is to make the topic a little less intimidating so that you can come in to the Dish and Dram or your other local uh, watering hole and talk with Matt or a bartender and really engage with whiskey as a topic. Uh, we know it can be intimidating. Uh, there was a period of time when there was elitism around it and it was hard to engage with. And let's be honest, the first time everyone drinks whiskey is not enjoyable for anybody. Even the people that uh, love it today, uh, it was a learning process where they learned to enjoy it. And part of that was uh, the same information that we're gonna give to you uh, today. Um, we're gonna do that. I'm gonna start with a little uh, local history, go into the basics and, and science of distilling and whiskey. Then we're gonna go uh, through some geography terms uh, about Scotch, Irish whiskey, international whiskey, and explore uh, various cocktails that uh, are made with it. And if you have any questions, we'd love for this to be a back and forth. So please take Connor up on her offer and uh, write some questions down and we'll be happy to uh, respond to them as we can. So I'm gonna dive in with a little history of Kensington because it's actually a little interesting. Uh, one of the most common questions we get is what dram means in the dish and dram. Uh, it started as a uh, measurement for a small amount of liquid. Uh, colloquially in the United Kingdom, that became a small drink of whiskey. And Kensington was dry until 2012, actually. They were dry for a very long time. Uh, a local restaurateur named Jeff Black, if you are local, you might remember Addie's uh, or a series of restaurants he has in DC. He engaged with Kensington to, uh, when he was talking about expanding his, his restaurant group, and in front of the town hall, he told them that he could not make the economics of a restaurant work in a dry town. So that restaurant eventually became Black's Market over in Garrett Park, just on the other side of Connecticut. And a couple of years later, the town reversed their decision and started offering liquor licenses. And that was the first domino that created the process for uh, the Dish and Jam being here today. Um, Whiskey and distillation in general has been around for several thousand years. Uh, many ancient cultures, uh, Egypt, India, China, they all uh, have at least the idea or at least the understanding of what distillation was uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, in fact, the, but the first process or the first use of distillation was not as a beverage, but instead was in the perfume industry, which when you think about it kind of makes sense because we all know how closely tied aroma and flavor sensations are. So they found that by uh, distilling a liquid mixture and being able to separate it into its components, they were able to condense certain aspects of it and uh, really strengthen them and produce something uh, entirely new and different. Um, the first distillation in Europe was probably from uh, grapes, it was probably a fruit-based uh, base um, that today would be known as brandy. Um, whiskey came a little later uh, when they learned about fermenting grains. Uh, so fermentation is the process of uh, taking cereal grains, uh, malting them, which we'll go over, uh, which creates uh, simpler sugars in the grain for the yeast to consume and produce alcohol. And then heating it up because the liquid vaporizes at different times and different temperatures. And then very intentionally cooling down those vapors and collecting the ones that you wanna keep and collecting the ones that have flavor and aroma compounds and uh, losing the ones that you don't. And that's how you create a base spirit. And that's the basic process of uh, creating whiskey. Um, the first country to really be known for uh, its whiskey production was Ireland. And, uh, and that's gonna go into the Irish whiskey history a little bit. Yeah, and so you guys have probably all heard about Jameson, Bushmills, some of the bigger brands from Ireland, but there's actually a rich history behind them as well. Sort of piggybacking off what David said about perfumes, 
Irish monks actually drank perfume and they realized that it was also had, you know, a fun time while they were doing it. And so then they started uh, distilling things themselves. Now, uh, to be called an Irish whiskey, it has to be made in Ireland. Uh, it has to be under 9.48 ABV pre-aging, so before it's put in the barrels. It has to be fermented in, by yeast and has a mash of malted cereal grain. Now, what you'll hear there, except for the Ireland, is a lot of things that are just kind of the definition of whiskey. Um, now, within Irish whiskey, there are a couple different types. There's going to be single malt, which means it's made at a single distillery. That's what the single is. And then malt means it's going to be malted barley. Uh, and then there's also pot still, single pot still whiskey. Again, single is going to be uh, just coming from the one distillery rather than blending it from a couple other distilleries from around. Um, but that can be used malted and unmalted barley. Now, the reason for that is because in 16th, the 16th century, the king decided he wanted to get a little piece of the action with the money that was making. Irish whiskey was very popular all throughout um, uh, far reaches uh, the British Empire. Uh, and so he said you had to pay taxes on that. Now, there, those were called Parliament Irish whiskeys. And uh, then it was actually called poteen, which eventually uh, turned into pot still. Now, uh, whiskeys like Green Spot um, are going to have stood the test of time um, with that. And uh, uh, it's a process still used to this day, but it's going to be used in the smaller pots rather than larger fermentation containers. Um, in 1821, there was only uh, 32 distilleries in Ireland. Um, but so they started opening up uh, the laws and regulations on it. And so by 1823, they were actually producing 10 million gallons of whiskey, uh, which was more than even Scotland was doing at the time. Uh, then in 1832, everything kind of flipped. Aeneas Coffee invented uh, the coffee still, which was a much more efficient way of doing things. Uh, but the Irish were a little set in their ways. And so they uh, resisted that sort of mechanization for a while. Um, that's where you get the difference of the spelling of the word whiskey. Before that, it was all spelled uh, whiskey just with a Y at the end. And the Irish, in order to differentiate from uh, all the other whiskeys made around the world, they added an E in there. And you'll actually see that in American bourbons and actually around the world, uh, with the exception of Scotland, uh, Japanese Scotch, and uh, some Canadian, that is, uh, Canadian ones as well. Um, then in the late 1980s, uh, there was a revival. Uh, so with that, they're kind of sticking to their old ways and America was kind of the last place that was buying Irish whiskey and then prohibition hit. Um, and so in the late 1880s, you really see everything start to ramp up and all the Irish whiskey sort of blow up that you see today. Now the word whiskey actually comes from an Irish term, uh, phrase from Gaelic uh, let me see if I can pronounce it. Whispera, which means uh, water of life, and whispera, so it slowly became whiskey. Um, now, just to touch on a little bit of scotch, I'm going to pass it over to Davis. Uh, so I'm going to backtrack just a moment, and I'm going to go through uh, the term malted. Uh, one of the big, it's a very common term. They could see how it would be one that would uh, prevent people from engaging with whiskey. So, I told you before that uh, brandy came before whiskey because the sugars in fruit and grapes are much more accessible to the yeast. Uh, the process of malting barley is uh, when uh, the distiller starts the germination process of a cereal grain by soaking it in hot water. It kind of thinks that it's time to grow and it contains the enzymes, so it actually breaks down um, its complex carbohydrates into simpler sugars um, that it would use to grow. And then uh, this distiller will cut that process short and create a kind of liquid mixture, um, kind of a porridge that has a lot of simple sugars in it to which the yeast is introduced. And then the yeast eats the sugars, uh, produces alcohol, CO2, and heat, and, and that's fermentation. Um, so the process of stopping the uh, germination is a drying process. And scotch uh, is most well known for how it stops 
the germination process. It burns, they burn uh, peat bog, peat moss, a really dense moss that Scotland historically has used in the place of wood or lumber or timber. Um, you think about Scotland, you think of the big wide prairies, you don't necessarily think of dense forests like you would with continental uh, Europe or United States. So they, that's how they developed uh, the process of using peat. And that's a big process, that's a big part of why scotch is what it is, is the kind of smokiness and those flavor and aroma compounds that the malted barley picks up uh, when they burn the peat to, to stop that germination process. Um, beyond that, as Max said, uh, Ireland, Scotland, the United Kingdoms um, and their empire was a big part of the growth of whiskey, uh, of which scotch plays a large role. Um, one thing that needs to be mentioned is uh, wine was actually for a long time a big competitor to scotch and to whiskeys. Um, a louse in the late 1800s, 1880, 1890 called Phylloxera kind of decimated the wine industry. And that's when whiskey, uh, Irish Scotch whiskey really took off and became um, accessible to the masses because wine was very difficult to produce for, for many decades there. Um, as Matt said, uh, the term Scotch, besides the flavor profiles brought about um, geographically in Scotland, is actually very limited to just the fact that it's made in Scotland. Um, if you go, with, if you're in Scotland and you order uh, Scotch, they're going to look at you funny because it's just called whiskey. So. I really want you not to think of the terms Irish and Scotch and bourbon and the ones we go over as reasons not to engage with it. Um, they really actually have very simple, very easily to understand terms. And once you get past those terms and you get into uh, different flavor profiles and uh, then you kind of can engage with what you might like, what you enjoy and start the process of having your own relationship with, with whiskey. Um, Scotland uh, as a relatively small country is broken down to five subdivisions for the Scotch production. And when you talk about Scottish whiskey, you're basically talking about different, different intensities of uh, how much peat is used. Um, you have Isla, Highlands, Midlands, Campbelltown, Campbelltown, and Speyside. Um, Isla, Speyside are known for being heavily peated whiskeys, which will have a lot of those smoky compounds. Um, that's something you enjoy. That's my favorite kind of scotch. I encourage you to explore those areas. Uh, Lowlands, Campbelltown, a little smoother, a little less smoky, um, more richer, fuller sensation in the mouth. Um, and, and that's another way to approach scotch as well. Um, the cocktail we've chosen today to present to you to kind of uh, introduce you to scotch is the highball. It's also one of the simplest cocktails you're ever gonna find. It, it's pretty much just scotch and soda water. It allows those complex aromas and uh, flavor profiles, the nuanced stuff. You're not covering it up with a strong mixer um, and you're not over diluting it, but you are making it nice and approachable and smooth. Oh, something else I did wanna go over. Uh, as Matt was talking about the ABV requirements for producing whiskey, um, that distillation process, as that spirit comes off the still, as they're turning that uh, vapor back into liquid alcohol, that's traditionally up 60, 80% alcohol. And what we consume here, most of it is 40%, about 80 proof. In that process, the distiller is bringing down the ABV by adding water. And um, it's one of the biggest misconceptions that I see at the bar, which upsets me, is people being overwhelmed by the intensity of and the burn of the alcohol and then saying that that's not for them. There is no shame in adding uh, ice cube, a couple of, a couple of drops of water um, to make it enjoyable. Uh, trust us, whiskey is strong enough that it can take it. Um, you're not insulting the distiller. They've already added water. It really is. It's completely acceptable. And I encourage you to figure out what you enjoy. So um, Connor here is going to play a clip of Matt yesterday making a scotch highball. And he'll narrate it for you. Yep. So I, uh, I came to Dishing Dram yesterday to film Matt in action behind the bar. So we got some videos for you and you guys are really experts. I, you know, I'm learning a lot. I used to live in Ireland and I uh, really enjoyed whiskey when I was there. So you guys are awesome. And again, like Davis was saying, uh, this is going to be one of the simpler cocktails uh, you'll see. Uh, 
It's just going to be uh, scotch poured over ice. Uh, I did a two ounce pour, so you can get it. That's gonna be a 16 ounce glass there. I chose the monkey shoulder scotch. It's one of my favorites. It's actually gonna be blended scotch. Um, monkey shoulder uh, gets its name from for mechanization. The uh, people that worked at the distillery had to mill the peat by hand. And that was a process uh, that required moving large amounts uh, with your shoulders. So because of that, people that work there would actually end up being slumped over a little bit because their back muscles were so much stronger than uh, on their front. And there was a condition called monkey shoulder and also makes a really good scotch. Mm, nice one. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so going after uh, the scotch, the Japanese uh, actually make what they like to call scotch there too. Some people in Scotland aren't as pleased about it, but they do put out a very nice high quality. Um, the Yamasaki uh, 12 was actually rated best whiskey in the world a couple years back. Starts out uh, in Japan of 1819, a man named Masa <laughs> Tasa Suri um, went to Scotland and studied with some of the master distillers there. And then he brought it back and they started distilling in Yamasaki. Um, it's going to be very similar to Highland Scotches and basically they will replicate uh, the, uh, almost any of the styles there. It's going to be more aromatic and a little bit lighter than the traditional Scotches that you're probably from Callens, Talskers, anything you're more used to, blend fittage. Uh, that comes from actually the oak trees that grow in Japan. Um, now, at first, when they started, they were importing oak from America, from France, from it's in order to age it, because with the quick aging process of two years, four years, six years, even eight years, produced a really sharp and um, not as enjoyable whiskey. But they found out that if you left it in there for about 20 years, it became smooth, velvety, and perfect. Um, it's not as popular as kind of the other four we're going to touch on, but uh, it is a very nice uh, whiskey to try if you can. Now, moving on to rye. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I apologize. We're doing bourbon, bourbon next. <laughs> um, so bourbon is by the name uh, most people know. Uh, it's by the most common, at least well-known, uh, where we're broadcasting in the United States. Um, and just to kind of sum up some of the terms, Japanese, Scotch, Irish, bourbon, a lot of those terms are defined locally. Um, their international usage can be a little different. They're only enforced by trade agreements. Um, they don't necessarily have to uh, be apples to apples the same. Um, so bourbon is an American term. It's an American product. It is not necessarily produced uh, in Kentucky. Uh, any state in the US can produce bourbon. Um, it basically, uh, the predominant definition is that it's 51% corn. So like we were talking about the European, Irish, and Scotch whiskeys, those were predominantly barley. Uh, the corn production in the US uh, made bourbon um, more uh, corn focused. Um, so it has to be 51% corn. Uh, if there's a, a large amount of wheat in the match bill, then you'll find a weeded bourbon or a large amount of rye in that other 49%. It's a, a high rye bourbon, but that 51% corn is, is where that comes from. Uh, the other definition of bourbon is that they're all aged in new oak, uh, new charred oak barrels. So every time a barrel is filled, uh, it's kind of a first fill, second fill, third fill, uh, a greater percentage of the vanilla and tannic uh, structure that is gained from the char and from the barrel is used. So bourbon is famous for that uh, very creamy vanilla and charred flavor, uh, almost a little brown sugar flavor, because they're only ever allowed to use uh, new oak barrels. Uh, so it's also another reason that you'll find a lot of bourbon barrel aged products, uh, beer, wine, etc. The market actually has a lot of these uh, single use barrels on there and the barrels are very expensive. Um, so that is a, a, a predominant part of bourbon. Um, it's also because uh, there's a more sugar in the corn, it's actually with the kind of it was the first time that whiskey really embraced a little sweetness and the sensation of sweetness can create a very full 
uh, mouthfeel as opposed to something of uh, spice or acidic kind of flavor profiles, which are more linear and more crisp. Um, so that's why bourbon has really become uh, one of the uh, predominant whiskeys of cocktails. Um, we're gonna go here into the old fashioned, uh, so-called because it was one of the original cocktails um, to the point where it almost didn't need a name and it was just called the old fashioned cocktail. So uh, here Connor's gonna play you a clip of Matt making an old fashioned. Before I play the clip, I have a quick question from Wendy. She loves bourbon, it's her favorite whiskey. And she's wondering, uh, can you please talk about the bitters that you should use to enhance the cocktails, especially with uh, bourbon? Sure, so like I said, it's like, um, like how, because of that corn flavor profile, or the corn sweetness um, can create a very full uh, mouthfeel. Once you start uh, playing around with it, you do find that a bittering agent um, like bitters uh, can create a little nice contrast to that, a little crispness at the beginning and end of your tastes. Um, so that's actually very important to include bittering agents or bittering pro like a, if you want to balance out a cocktail, especially something like a Manhattan or an old fashioned in which you've actually added a little simple syrup or some sugar to it and uh, vermouth, that bittering agent is what can bring that back to a more crisp and a more kind of balanced flavor, flavor profile and not overly sweet or overly kind of viscous in your mouth. And also in the past couple of years, I would say what about 10, 15, there's been more flavored uh, bitters, which you can completely change the complexity of your drink. Um, so one of the ones I really like to use, uh, you're gonna see a traditional old fashioned in a second, but I uh, will do a butterscotch old fashioned you switch the ingredients around and then you add chocolate bitters and it interacts with the agave and it gives it a real unique flavor that doesn't really match up with anything else. I like using sometimes cherry bitters in a uh, summertime old fashioned, things like that. So the old fashioned really is something you can jump off of in very different directions and make it taste very differently, but it all comes from the same basic spot. Wendy says, wow to butterscotch. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on down. And then we had two actually other questions. One was going back to scotch. So one of our attendees, Carol, she toured the I don't want to mis mispronounce it, but it's Edradour, E-D-R-A-D-O-U-R distillery. And she's new to whiskey. So she's wondering if you know about this brand and its reputation. Should have put it on the table. You want to take that one a little bit? Um, I actually don't know a ton about Edradour. We actually just brought it into the, uh, the restaurant just a couple of weeks back. That's actually my first experience with it. Um, do you have more? Personally? Just a little bit. Yeah, it's newer to me as well. Um, I know that it is going to be a family farm uh, scotch, which makes it a little bit smaller and more distinct. And so it's going to be a little bit more expensive because it's harder to come by. It's interesting because as a scotch, I feel like it drinks a little bit more like a dark rum. So you'll get kind of those thicker molasses flavors. And uh, circling back to the bitters question, if I'm making an old fashioned with that. I'm going to use orange bitters to kind of highlight it, just like I would with the dark aged rum. And one last question, how much sugar is in a glass of bourbon? <laughs> well, depends how much bourbon you drink in your glass. <laughs> <laughs> well, funnily enough, most drinks, uh, just as a rule, this isn't specifically to answer your question, most drinks have a very similar caloric value. Um, once you've uh, once you've changed the amount of volume for beer, wine, liquor, uh, you actually end up pretty much coming between 90 to 130 calories per drink. Um, whiskey, I expect to be in that realm as well. That's just a rule of thumb that I use for, for beer, wine, and, and certain things. I, I feel pretty confident that whiskey will fall in that range. All right, now we can get to the old fashioned. Okay, and so the old fashioned uh, is something you definitely want to mix in the glass. The reason for that is you don't want to dilute this drink too much. Uh, you're going to start with, I chose the Elijah Craig bourbon of, um, or this one, their small batch. It's really good and it's a great value as well. So you're going to put the ice in there. What I did was I made a brown sugar simple syrup, which is just going to be brown sugar and water and that's gonna be mixed and heated together. The reason I'm doing that is to accent those flavors that Davis was talking about when he was talking about bourbon. So you get that molasses, it goes really well with the vanilla 
and gives it a little bit more unique fill than just sort of your granulated white sugars. Um, as an accent, you want to go traditionally with a little uh, lemon twist, put it around the edge of the glass so that you get the flavors throughout and the oils. And I'm struggling a little bit here to get the cherry out. I like using the Luxardo cherries. Um, they're a lot better than the maraschino cherries. In my opinion, they're going to be soaked in alcohol themselves. So they are a little bit of fun there, just following there. Um, and there we go. We're ready to drink. And just to chime in on old fashions, if you do go to a bar, uh, not the dish and jam, that is how uh, we'll make your old fashioned if you order it here. Um, but if you go elsewhere, uh, there was a time period in which old fashions were made uh, a little differently, a much heavier hand with muddling um, the fruit, the citrus, get more oils out. Uh, after prohibition, there was a little bit, um, there was a period of time in which the quality of the whiskey produced was not necessarily um, what you'd expect, or it could be, uh, there, there was some nefarious action going on as well. That actually is the term uh, bottled and bond. Um, it's the government kind of uh, stepping in there. But so, that, so there's kind of two different times of old fashioned. You might get some with muddled cherry, muddled citrus, um, and a little kind of covering up the whiskey. We've embraced the idea that the whiskey nowadays is uh, produced much better, high quality stuff, no reason to cover it up if that's what, you, if that's what you're ordering. And so that's, um, and, and most, I think most bars in the area, I think we'll probably produce it that way, but there is something to keep an eye out for. The other way. And sometimes when I'm making an old fashioned, actually as an homage to the old way that it was made, I will use just one or two dashes of Angostura bitters, which is going to be your traditional bitters that you're most used to and accompanied uh, to. And then I'm going to add one dash of cherry bitters and one dash of orange bitters because the fruit that was muddled was more often going to be cherry, orange, and lemon. And you really are, lemon's such a distinct flavor just with the twist as the garnish, you get a lot of the flavor there. And then a fun little note about that cocktail. Uh, there's a lot of apocryphal stories about bourbon, uh, where it started, where the name comes from. Um, there's actually no unanimous agreement on that, but one of them is that Elijah Craig was uh, the inventor of bourbon. But um, I think that's been dismissed, but it's a, it's a fun little note about Elijah Craig whiskey. As much as anybody invented it, he, uh, he was up there. He's in the top tier. Um, so next is uh, whiskey sour. Uh, also very traditional, probably less seen now than, uh, than in the past, but at one time, a uh, very common drink. So here's Matt making a whiskey salad. So the first thing you'll notice here is that I'm not going to make it starting in the glass. We're actually gonna start in the shaker tin. You're gonna have a little bit of simple syrup. So this one, uh, since it's interacting with the citrus, I will just use your traditional sugar water instead of the brown sugar. Uh, then we're going to add fresh squeezed lemon juice um, with that as well. Um, and we'll put that in there too. The lemon juice is the reason that it's in the shaker tin. With the citrus, you want to activate that and dilute it a little bit more. So you shake it not too much so that it gets all the way watered down. And then of course you add the bourbon. I picked Jim Beam for this. Just to highlight, since when you have all these mixers, if you use maybe a higher end bourbon, some of the complexities would be lost. So if you're using a Jim Beam, if you like Bullet, whatever the one, I, if I'm going cheap whiskey sometimes, um, I'll even go all the way down to um, Virginia Gentleman or something like that. If you, if you mix it and if you make the cocktail properly, um, that'll all be good for you. But here, when you get the shake, you want to make sure that you have the ice hit every part of the drink. That's why I look a little weird going up and down, back and forth, and not just straight up and down so that you really slosh it around. Add fresh ice to the glass. Um, and then we are going to do what's called a double strain. That's just to make sure the big chunks don't fall out. And then I'm going to grab my micro strainer and pour on top so that all the chips get in there. Because nobody wants to take a nice big sip and then get a little tiny piece of ice that's unsettling a little bit. And then our garnish here, again, is going to be our brandy cherry. And I learned my lesson this time. Uh, I had it already on the pit. <laughs> there we go, ready to drink. Do you want to talk a little bit about the difference between uh, shaking and stirring and the, the purpose of it? 
Yeah, so with stirring, you really are trying to elevate. Usually when you stir, you're not going to have citrus in it and you don't want to dilute the drink as much. Where you shake, it really does wake up the drink and allows the flavors to shine through. The last is rye. Right, sure. Um, so the next one we're moving into is rye. So rye is the other American spirit. Rye, just like bourbon, is going to be made predominantly in the U.S. Canadians uh, do make some good rye as well. Uh, Crown Royal Rye, it's actually a really nice one, pretty um, reasonably priced as well. But you're going to have 51% rye or more rather than 51% corn, uh, like there was in the bourbon. Now this uh, gives it a distinct flavor. It's got a spice to it, but don't think spice like jalapeno pepper, Tabasco, or even black pepper. Think of baking spices, but without the sugar. So if you can think of bread with no sugar, it's kind of hard to sort of conceptualize, but that's what uh, you're going to get as the predominant flavor for the rye. Um, and rye is very local. So in the 1600s, the uh, German and Dutch from Pennsylvania teamed up with the Irish and Scott from Maryland. Uh, to create what's called Maryland rye. Um, now the Pennsylvania rye whiskey was also done as then as well. So the difference between the two is the rye and barley is going to be in the Pennsylvania rye whiskey. And in the Maryland rye whiskey is the rye and corn. Now, based on what we said on scotch, you can expect the Pennsylvania style rye whiskey um, to be a little bit uh, more, what's the word? Ringing, linear, linear, Ringing, more, Ringing, less, linear. less full in the mouth, mm. um, more crisp, more kind of spicy. And then the Maryland rye, that's going to be a little bit sweeter. So that'll edge towards bourbon. I hate to say more spicy, less spicy, because then people sometimes, oh, they expect it to be hot. Um, and then after 1776, um, America was cut off from the Caribbean island. So we couldn't get our favorite spirit at the time, which was rum because that's where all the molasses came from. Um, and rye became the predominant spirit that was drank in the US. Uh, in 1810, there was about three times as many uh, rye distilleries produced, gallons of rye produced than bourbon in America. And then aged rye came about um, actually kind of an accidental discovery as they were being shipped in barrels across the country it added to the profile and they very much liked it. Uh, customers did. Um, now, rye was pricier than bourbon to make. And so when prohibition happened in the 1920s, um, the bootleggers may, were able to make bourbon a lot more easily and all the rye had to be imported from Canada and it was usually considered like lower tier, you know, you're below the rail sort of whiskeys. And so it kind of started getting this bad rap. And um, over time, you know, Hollywood would produce that only uh, bourbon was being drank by the sophisticated and all that sort of stuff. And uh, so once we got up to the 1980s, rye had kind of fallen out of favor. And then there was a, there has been a 500% increase since 2009. Sort of as an apology uh, to the rye community, um, uh, if you guys have ever seen the show Mad Men, they specifically have Don Draper when he's talking to Conrad Hilton, order a rye Manhattan. And everyone's kind of been piggybacking on that. And the craze has been getting better and better. And there's some great Maryland ryes. Um, Sagamore, right here, as you can tell, it's very well lined. There's barely any left. Um, it's a great distillery that is local. It's up in Baltimore and actually has some roots in Kensington as well. Their owner, uh, his mother used to be the mayor of Kensington Rubber. Yep, so uh, that's the planks. Just yeah. to throw, throw one of the planks. <laughs> so Jane Plank, is, and, uh, Kevin Plank is the owner of Under Armour, Marilyn DeLong. Um, he started Sagamore Spirits. Um, I think as, a, as an ode to the history Matt was talking about, uh, they produce exclusively rye whiskeys. Um, one thing I did want to go over, I'm sorry we're running out of time. There's so many things, uh, so many specific terms. Like I said at the beginning, the, uh, the goal is really to give you guys a comfort level so that you can continue this discussion on your own uh, with bartender or with, uh, with the salesman at the BOC, uh, figure out what you like. Um, we mentioned, uh, I'm gonna go age statements really quick because I think that's one of the most prohib uh, prohibitive aspects of a whiskey bottle that when you're looking at it, 
Um, an age statement uh, references the youngest whiskey in the bottle. Um, a lot of whiskeys are blends. Um, so you see them count at 12 is a 12 year. Uh, that means the, uh, the youngest whiskey in that bottle will be aged 12 years in cask. Um, whiskey only ages in barrel. Um, once it gets bottled, uh, it no longer changes. It's different than wine like that. So you'll see the corkage of uh, whiskey bottles are, are not uh, cork. They're, they're something uh, stopping the air from getting in. Um, generally, when you, when you age a whiskey, it loses some of the spicy notes and gains a little oxidation, a little reductive value that creates a smoother, uh, smoother profile. So that's in general uh, why whiskey is the more expensive uh, the older you get. A little bit of it evaporates out of the barrel, so you need to make up that product. Um, I think the sweet spot for someone starting out, uh, six to eight to 10 years, no real reason to go uh, much beyond that um, until you have uh, comfort level. Um, anything beyond uh, 14, 18, you're probably, uh, at least in my personal opinion, you're not necessarily getting your dollars for dollars uh, increase in enjoyment at that point. So uh, that's generally how I approach age statements. Um, you want to do, um, just to touch on Tennessee whiskey, it's, um, going to be made in Tennessee. Uh, it's very close to bourbon as well. Uh, one of the biggest difference is that, well, also you can't, you can use used uh, charred oak barrels, but it's filtered over charcoal. So you get a distinct misty, mesquite taste to it. Um, and we have one more packet here for you that Matt made with uh, the Sacramore Rye. Uh, this is our Manhattan, which Connor will play for you here. Here we go, we're gonna move in into the Manhattan and as you see, we're going, this is gonna be a stirring cocktail. That's a mixing tin right there. You're gonna have two ounces of the rye here and the recipe Manhattans are really fun and easy to remember because the area code Manhattan is going to be two, one, two. Uh, you're gonna have two ounces of your base, which we chose rye here. You can also make it with bourbon and then one ounce of your sweet vermouth. Uh, I like using the Dolan. It's a good baseline uh, vermouth. And then two dashes of the Angostura bitters. Now we're going to stir. And when you stir, you really wanna stay around the outside of the glass. So you wanna keep it loose in your hand. You don't wanna be breaking the ice cubes up, diluting the water too much. Um, and then you're going to have a cherry again for garnish. Seems to be a theme with the cherry garnishes. They go very well with whiskey. We like our cherries here. Our fancy <laughs> cherry. And then I always double strain as well, uh, just to make sure you don't get a little bit, even though you're trying your best with the stir and you're going to dilute it a whole lot less. You're going to break a whole lot less of the ice chips. There we go. And if you, if you have never experimented with the fancy expensive cherries, I, I highly recommend you do. They're pretty different from the maraschino. Um, they're pretty fantastic. Also good on ice cream sundaes. Also good on ice cream sundaes. <laughs> um, well, that was a fast 45 minutes. Um, happy to take questions. And of course, you're always welcome to come down to the Dish and Dram and continue this uh, with Matt and I here. Um, but I think that's, uh, that's just for, for us for today. We have just one other question. So Betsy was wondering, how do you know kind of what's a good bottle of whiskey to get somebody? I know that's a big question because there's so many different types, but you know, maybe she's bringing it to a party as a gift. Well, parties haven't happened in a long time, but <laughs> as a gift, um, what would you recommend? Um, I try to stay away from the things I see advertised on TV. Uh, because that you kind of want the things that already have a name for themselves, uh, like Green Spot. You want something that's approachable. It's and don't go for something with a fancy label uh, as well. I don't know. That's kind of an open ended. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess uh, I guess I'm assuming that you're you're asking um, if you're flying blind, if you don't know what kind of whiskey you like. I think that's yeah. That's I would more, say that. Yeah. Really difficult. Um, I would, at that point, I would kind of, if, if you know for a fact that they're a whiskey uh, lover, I think you kind of have to bite the bullet and ask them, at least in generalities, what they enjoy. If you 
I have a fear that if you get a whiskey drinker, uh, something, and they've already established, they have already come to terms in the, like, what they like and they know that, getting that person a bottle that is outside of that, um, it's probably, uh, it's probably not what you're going for. Um, so, uh, and then if you're, if you're, if you are just going to fly blind and you want to surprise them or, if, or they don't know whiskeys as well, and uh, you want to get them the bottle to get into it and, and you're starting from that, um, I think you want to look at something, um, six to eight. I actually, my favorite nowadays, especially if this is a non-whiskey drinker is Irish whiskey, um, in their production, it's triple pot distilled, um, creates a much smoother kind of whiskey than say uh, a scotch or bourbon. Um, the, the, the knock on Irish whiskeys is that, I think of them as the opposite of rye. So the way that we describe rye as being a little spicier and having that rye forward flavor profile, which has a lot of flavor to it. Um, uh, Irish whiskey, uh, in general, all pot distilled whiskeys are distilled at least twice. So they, they heat up the, the liquid in a, a giant pot and then it kind of the vapor goes off and then they collect that and they put that back into the pot and they do it a second time. And then for uh, Irish whiskey, they do it a third time, um, which at the cost of maybe a little bit, some of those volatile compounds or the, the flavor aromatic compounds that um, might degrade in that process. What you do get is you also lose the coarser compounds or the ones that uh, create a harsher flavor profile. So, um, so I can't be more specific, but yeah, for non-drinker, Irish um, for a drinker, I think you got to bite the bullet and kind of uh, get gauge what they like and, and do that way. And we're right down the street. We're always trying to look at, we like drinking these whiskeys. We're always looking at the new ones that are coming to the area. Pop in, have a glass of wine. If you're not a drinker or beer, talk to one of us for two or three minutes. We're happy to. It's one of the fun aspects of our job. And so just stop on by and hopefully we can help guide you in a direction. Thank you both so much for this. You're excellent. And I hope, I know everybody learned a ton today. Um, and I just wanna say, so we're, we'll be picking five random names and we'll get, give you a little coupon for a free cocktail at Dish and Dram and then 10% off of your meal. So you can get that to go um, or dine in, which I know that they are doing now. And they, uh, they're busy, they gotta get back to their restaurant. It's open as we speak. Um, so I really want to thank you both for taking the time to share your expertise with us. Um, and just we're really grateful and uh, have a great day. Thanks for having us. Thank All you. right. Bye. Bye-bye.